Good afternoon, conference. I'm delighted to be here celebrating our referendum success since freeing our country from the shackles of Brussels. I must start by offering my personal thanks to Nigel, who I've campaigned alongside in UKIP for over 20 years and whose leadership got us the referendum. I also want to say a huge thanks to my other great friend, Paul Nuttall, who has also worked so hard and been an able deputy to Nigel. But more importantly, I want to thank you, the grassroots kippers whose tireless campaigning won the day. And because of you all, we're on the way to getting our country back. Thank you. I've been asked to talk about the Commonwealth in today's new world, a world full of new opportunities for the United Kingdom, free from the stranglehold of EU membership. I want to share my vision of a confident UK reclaiming its place within a forward-looking Commonwealth, leaving behind the stagnation of an inward-looking EU dominated by bureaucrats and their petty empire building. We live in a world that is governed by networks between countries, people, businesses, in a way that we've never seen before. I've been an advocate and supporter of the Commonwealth Network, perhaps the globe's oldest network, spanning every continent, all of my life. The Commonwealth's relevance enables it to add its collective voice and action to the global challenges that all its members and the world face. Despite decades of government and charity support, Africa faces as many challenges as ever before. Our current approach, ladies and gentlemen, simply doesn't work. But now that we'll have control of our own trade policy, we can lead the world by example by following a policy of trade, not aid. We can get rid of wasteful government foreign aid programmes and open up these networks, not only making food cheaper in the UK, but also providing real opportunities in Africa with the economic stimulus provided by exports to our country. But why is the Commonwealth best place to achieve this? I'll, be I'll begin by setting out its relevance today and how this ready-made network can with engagement and momentum from all its members, help deliver security and prosperity for all of us. I believe the world sees the UK, as do especially other Commonwealth members, as a leader, exemplifying the principles that bring us all together. Freedom, democracy, good governance and the rule of law, free trade and human rights. As a British MEP, I care about helping the UK become a more secure, more prosperous country existing in a world where certain basic values are upheld. The world order has shifted. Economic power and influence is moving east and south with the rise of the emerging economies in Asia, Africa and Latin America. The world has become more interconnected through trade, technology and universal global challenges, such as energy, security and terrorism. Events that happen in one part of the world no longer happen in isolation. More often than not, the impact can be felt across continents, often very quickly. The financial crisis that has engulfed the West, or the revolutions that have spread across the Middle East and North Africa, have fiscal or political ramifications across the globe. This greater interdependence means that we must work together on the important global issues. A part of my vision for the Commonwealth is that it is a strong force on the world stage. And why wouldn't it be? Several Commonwealth members are also members of the UN Security Council, the G20 and other important global bodies. Where our interests overlap, we should make clear what our common position is. The Commonwealth Network, with its shared principles and similar legal systems and common language, make it an ideal platform for doing business, trade, investment and development, which will, of course, lead to prosperity for all its members. I see an increased commitment to democratic values and increased trade as two sides of the same coin. In fact, 
if I had one word to respond to the question, how is the Commonwealth relevant today, it would be trade. The facts are staggering, and they show that the relative importance of intra-Commonwealth trade has increased significantly over time. Over the last two decades, the importance of, com to com of Commonwealth members to each other as sources of imports has grown by a quarter, and as a third as destinations for exports. More than half of Commonwealth countries now export over a quarter of their total exports to other Commonwealth members. The Commonwealth Society wrote a report called Trading Places, the Commonwealth Effect Revisited. The paper made it clear that there is indeed a Commonwealth factor when it comes to intra-Commonwealth trade. The research found that when both trading partners were Commonwealth members, the value of trade was likely to be a third to a half more than when one or both of the trading partners was a non-Commonwealth country. This X factor, if you like, can be explained in part by our common history culture and the beliefs that tie Commonwealth member states together. The facts speak for themselves. The Commonwealth is good for business. Five of the top 10 countries in which to do business are Commonwealth countries, and 17 of the top 20 countries in which to do business in Sub-Saharan Africa are also Commonwealth members. Is it any wonder that the Commonwealth brand is increasingly sought after and our badge increasingly valued? The trade worth over three trillion US dollars occurs annually within the Commonwealth, and its combined GDP nearly doubled between 1990 in 2009. It contains several of the world's fastest growing economies and will shape the global economy of the future, including India, South Africa, Malaysia, Nigeria and Singapore, and five members of the G20. The middle class in the Commonwealth is expanded by nearly one billion people in the last two decades, and the Commonwealth contains 31 per cent of the global population, representing a huge and growing consumer market. This network also provides us links to other global networks which can benefit us all. For example, Singapore, Brunei and Malaysia link us to ASEAN and make up a quarter of ASEAN's entire GDP. Canada is the third largest economy in the Commonwealth and an important gateway to the USA for many countries. 44 of the G77 countries are members of the Commonwealth as are 19 of the 39 African Union countries, 12 of both the Caribbean Community and the Organisation of the Islamic Conference, 10 of the Pacific Island Forum, and 7 of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. This equates to huge opportunities for our partnerships within the Commonwealth and to help us all to compete in these peripheral markets. We must press for the Commonwealth to be utilised fully to help lift the prosperity of all its members for increased free and fair trade. It must become a leading voice in the global economy, working to liberalise trade and break down barriers for international business. Member states are investing in the Commonwealth family, where the wealthiest countries in the world sit alongside some of the poorest. India has increased commitments by providing, up, by providing up to 7 million a year to the 19 African members of the, of the Commonwealth through the Special Commonwealth Assistance in Africa programme. As UKIP's Commonwealth spokesman, I strongly champion its values, advocating for small and developing countries to take collective interest in issues such as debt relief and ensuring that Commonwealth institutions are fit for purpose, focused and working to our strengths. It is vital that the Commonwealth returns to its brand strengths of democracy and development. The UK has a very real interest in seeing Commonwealth countries maintaining democratic integrity and the rule of law. I want to strengthen Commonwealth that protects our values, but is also able to work constructively and offer encouragement to those facing challenges to democratic development. Small and vulnerable states should be reassured by the network offering them a solid platform from which to voice their opinions and receive timely assistance and support on issues facing us all. UKIP's challenge is to raise awareness of and build support for the Commonwealth and this as an alternative to that ghastly single market and show the misguided attitude 
of Project Fear for what it really was. We in UKIP have led our country back into the world, giving us the opportunity to take full advantage of our options. We're forward-looking, open and engaged, and in my role as both an MEP and our Commonwealth spokesman, I want to make sure that UKIP does the same with both old friends and new. One of my very few pleasures within the European Parliament is the ability to work closely with like-minded parties and movements across Europe, like Peter, who we've just heard from. Whilst we've won our referendum and our freedom, millions more remain trapped unwillingly in ever closer union, and we must also be ready to offer our advice and support to those still campaigning for a better Europe, one based on mutual friendship and national democracy. And whilst these allies and friends will remain valued, we must also look forward to establishing new partnerships with like-minded parties from across the Commonwealth. So now, as we look forward to the future, I would like to congratulate Diane James on her victory today. <laughs> British politics is in a state of flux, with the potential for huge gains for our party. The Easington elite has never been so detached and cared so little for its core working class support. Now more than ever, we need a strong alternative to the two main parties. After all, what was the point of fighting so hard for our democracy just to hand it back to the same old establishment again? While some wrongly suggest that it might be job done for UKIP, I say we are needed now more than ever. Yeah. Conference, I believe that fortune favours the brave. And now, as we head back out into the world, that world is our oyster and the Commonwealth is the precious pearl within it. Thank you.